Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm Dr. Vishwesharan, currently working as a consultant in interventional pulmonology at Ashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad in India. So it gives us immense pleasure to uh, welcome you to this web meet on single-use bronchoscopy. And uh, I would also like to convey the regards from our director, Dr. Pavan, and the entire team of uh, Ashoda Hospitals to all the uh, delegates on board. So we all know that single-use bronchoscopy is revolutionizing the field of interventional pulmonology. So today we have this web meet with two of our eminent speakers, Dr. Ashutosh from USA, as well as Dr. Uh, Ulf Gang from Germany, who will be sharing their insights on the utility of the single-use bronchoscope. Together, I'll be presenting my talk on single-use bronchoscopy, the evidence and experience. So without wasting uh, much of the time, I'll take you through the first talk, uh, which is all about um, uh, the role of single-use bronchoscope, the evidence and uh, uh, experience. So I don't have any disclosures to make. So why are we really uh, concerned about uh, the role of single-use bronchoscope? This is because we need to understand that the bronchoscopy that we routinely perform in our clinical practice is a semi-critical procedure as per the Spalding's classification. It is a semi-critical semi procedure because it has a moderate risk of infection as the bronchoscope comes in contact with the mucous membrane and it does not enter the sterile tissue or the vasculature. But if you use a biopsy forceps or if you use the same bronchoscope for a therapeutic procedure, then it has a capacity to breach the mucosa and therefore it may become a critical procedure. So if your routine for your routine bronchoscopy, you need to do a high level disinfection, whereas all the accessories that you use in the bronchoscopy, which can breach the mucosa, needs to undergo sterilization. So the basic difference between the high-level disinfection and the sterilization is that your high-level disinfection eliminates all the bacteria, viruses, and fungi, with the exception of some bacterial spores, whereas when you sterilize an accessory, it also kills these spores. So why are we really concerned about the role of single-use bronchoscopy? So if you go back to the if you go back to the data that is produced from uh, some surveys across the globe, you can find out that the global single-use bronchoscope market expanded at a CAGR of 16.7% from 2018 to 2022. And it is expected that the utility of the single-use bronchoscope will reach a financial value of almost 3.26 billion US dollars by the end of 2033. And as on date, only 28 0.2% share of the global single-use endoscopes comes from single-use bronchoscope, whereas these single-use endoscopes are also being tried in the gast by the gastro colleagues as well as by the urology colleagues. So on date, if you see the single-use bronchoscope market size is only 392 million US dollars, but 10 years down the line, the projected market value is as high as 3.26 billion US dollars. And this gives us a important understanding that the single-use bronchoscopy is going to be the future of our uh, interventional pulmonology procedures. And this is this may in the future be, may become an um, essential alternative to the reusable bronchoscopes. So what advantages does a single-use bronchoscope actually he help us with? So if you go through this uh, diagram onto your left-hand side, for a re reprocessing of a reusable bronchoscope, it starts with a pre-cleaning, it goes to the leak testing, you have to do the manual cleaning, you have to do the visual inspection, you have to do the thermal reprocessing, rinsing, drying, storage, and then finally it comes to the end utility. But anywhere in this pathway, especially during the pathway of leak testing or manual cleaning or visual inspection or drying or storage or during the end use, there is a high risk of transmitting the infection to the patient. So that is where the real role of the single-use bronchoscopy comes into play, which is essentially, essentially the prevention of a cross-contamination and a secondary infection. So people have tried to understand the effectiveness of reprocessing for flexible bronchoscope and endobronchial ultrasound bronchoscope. So in this study, what they tried to do was to, they did a direct observation of reprocessing methods for flexible bronchoscope using a multifaceted evaluation after manual cleaning and as well as after high levels of disinfection and assessment of storage condition. So they visually inspected the ports and the channels of a reusable bronchoscope using lighted magnification and bore scopes. 
and the contamination was detected using the microbial cultures as well as the test for proteins, hemoglobin, and adenosine triphosphate. So once they manually clean these scopes, they try to see what is the microorganisms that is found. And to the surprise, you can see that amongst in most of the cases of the pediatric scopes as well as the uh, standard adult scopes, you can find out that despite manual cleaning, there is an identification of a pathogenic organisms, which can be a low concerning organisms like the Chytococcus aerolatus, or it can be even a high concerning organism like a Stenotrophomonas multophilia. In addition to this, certain other bacterial organisms like Bacillus fastidius and Spingomonas E. coli, Shigella, were also found to be present in the scopes despite adequate manual cleaning. And even here, amongst all these therapeutic scopes as well, like in amongst most of these therapeutic scopes, you can find an identification of a path pathogenic microorganisms despite effective manual cleaning. So the researchers again try to understand, okay, let's apply a high level disinfection and now see what is the pathogenic organisms that is present after a high level disinfection. And to the surprise, even after an effective high level disinfection, there is still an isolation of organisms, microorganisms from these scopes, which again varied from low concerning organisms like Chytococcus aerolatus to high concerning organisms like Stenotrophomonas multophilia, which effectively means that despite high levels of disinfection, your scope may be contaminated with the microorganisms and you are at a risk of transmitting this infection to the patient. So they also try to observe the visual, uh, they also try to visually inspect the scopes. And the first A diagram which you see is the normal scope. But when they visually inspected the reusable scopes, they found out that more, few of these scopes had a dent and few of the scope, despite adequate manual cleaning and high level of disinfection, had residual fluid or even a filamentous debris, which can act as a nidus for your growth of a microorganisms and can result in high, result, high incidence of cross-contamination and infection. And in addition to this, they tried to uh, uh, visually inspect a normal, unused scope and a frequently used reusable scope. And they found out that after reusing the scopes for multiple times, they are able to demonstrate a wide brown rusty discoloration in the channel bifurcation, indicating that despite the best level of the care with the manual disinfection as well as high level disinfection, your scopes are prone to get contaminated and probably this contamination in critically uh, ill patients like an immunocompromised patients or in a transplant patients can result in cross contamination of infection. So they found out, uh, and in addition to this, they also try to understand the adherence or by the uh, technicians in reprocessing these scopes. And they found out that in the site A, B, and C, which they evaluated, there is always a certain level of uh, deviance from what is considered to be the standard norm which re with respect to the reprocessing of the scopes, which indicates that at the, at the site of reprocessing, there is still a chance that your reusable scope, despite the best possible um, uh, safety co consideration we take, can act as a source of cross-contamination and infection. So this study clearly showed that uh, the researchers examined 24 clinically used bronchoscopes and they found out that 100% of the bronchoscopes had residual contamination. And microbial growth was found in 14 fully reprocessed bronchoscopes, which is as high as 58%. And this microbial growth varied from moles, stenotrophomonas maltophilia, and E. coli and shigella, which indicates a high concerning organisms. And visible irregularities were observed in as high as 100% of scopes, which included a retained fluid, which was a brown, red, or oily residue, scratches, damaged insertion tubes and distillants, and even filamentous debris in the working channel. And reprocessing practices were substandard at two of three sites, indicating that your reprocessing scope can be a source of infection in your patients as well. In addition to this, there are other studies which try to understand the use of sterile single-use bronchoscope in decreasing the uh, post-procedure readmission rates and eliminating potential device cross-contamination. So this is an abstract which was submitted by um, uh, Dr. Garrett et al. So in this study, they found out that when reusable devices were used, the 30-day readmission in patients were 10% and outpatients were 7%, whereas with the use of the sterile single-use devices, the inpatient readmission 
uh, rates was only 4% and the outpatients was 4.90%. And the 30-day odds ratio for readmission when uh, uh, it was found to be 2.5 for the inpatient, 1.5 for the outpatient, and 2.3 for combined inpatient and outpatient together. So which means that when you use a reusable scope, there is a higher tendency for a potential uh, infection and need for either an inpatient or an outpatient readmission. So the authors concluded that the patients undergoing bronchoscopically typically have significant comorbidities, which increase their risk of development of potential device-related infections. And to reduce these risks, the use of a sterile single-use bronchoscope should be considered to eliminate reprocessing failures, improve the overall operational efficacy, and to reduce the potential acquisition of healthcare associated infections. So in addition to this, there is another study which tried to assess the bronchoscopy related infection and the development of uh, single use bronchoscopic technology. So this was in this study, uh, they compiled the data that was available across uh, different uh, healthcare settings like an academic institution, like a tertiary setting, and even university hospitals. And with respect to the cost effect, cost effectiveness, they found out that if the total number of the procedures um, are around 1,644 procedures per year in an academic institution, the cost borne by the single-use bronchoscopy is almost 232 pounds, whereas the reusable bronchoscopy is 78 pounds. But this much number of cases is generally happens only in an extremely high volume center, whereas in most of the other academic institutions where the procedures are almost around 328 procedures per year, if you see the cost analysis, the single-use uh, flexible bronchoscope and the reusable bronchoscope had almost similar cost, which means that until and unless you are working in an extremely high volume center where there are more than 1,000 procedures per year, probably then only your reusable scope can match the uh, uh, financial value of your single-use bronchoscope. But if you are working in a moderate centers with uh, procedures as high as 328 procedures per year, that it is, even if you use a single-use bronchoscope, the cost-effective analysis shows that both have almost similar cost. In addition to this, in a perioperative setting in a high, uh, high output uh, tertiary setting, they tried to find out, and they found out that if there was uh, without a 2.8 percentage infection rate, in the cost-effective analysis showed that the single-use bronchoscope in fact fared better than your reusable scope. But with your 2.8 percentage infection rate, which we saw earlier, they found out that if you take into consideration this post-procedural infection rate, then probably your reusable scope cost is going to be exponentially higher in comparison to your single-use bronchoscope. In addition to this, um, they also tried to understand three university hospitals and academic institutions uh, practice where they pulled up 2,200 procedures per year for each institution. And in such high volume centers, it was found that your re reusable bronchoscope did have some amount of a cost effective model in comparison to your single use bronchoscope. So this clearly shows that if you take into consideration the infection rate, then probably your single use bronchoscopy is cost effective in comparison to your reusable scopes. And in case if you are not dealing with an extremely high volume centers, then again, your single use bronchoscopy is cost effective as equivalent to your reusable scope. Only in areas where there is going to be extremely high uh, procedural turnover rates, probably your reusable bronchoscope is going to be more cost effective. But this data, what we have here is most from the developed countries from the West. And we need to have a lot of data in uh, developing countries to understand how your single use bronchoscopy can be a cost-effective modality for routine clinical practice. In addition to this, uh, this is another paper where a single-use or a disposable bronchoscope, they tried to evaluate all the data that was available from the benchtop and preclinical comparison of currently available devices. If you see in the market, we have a lot of these single-use bronchoscopes currently available. It can be a Pentax uh, medical one. The other one, which is most commonly used, is the Ambu uh, scope. The surgical company, the Bronchoflex scope, the Vatan scopes, the Boston Scientific scopes, and even the Exal TTM uh, Model B scopes. And there are still many other scopes which are indigenously produced as a single-use scopes which are available in the market. 
So if you look into the uh, specification comparison of these scopes, most of the scopes that are currently available, um, the adult scopes are having an outer diameter of around 5.8, uh, but few of them have ranged between uh, 5.3 to 5.8. The inner diameter varies between um, 2.8 to 3. And this 3 uh, millimeter can provide an effective therapeutic channel even for doing a complex interventional procedures. And all, almost all of them have a length of around uh, 600 um, uh, millimeters. And the weight is all, ranges between 95 to 133 grams. And the most important thing that we always um, think about when we are using a single-use bronchoscope or even for that matter, any other scope is the field of view. The field of view in the degrees ranges between um, 85 to uh, 120 degrees. And the depth of the view ranges between 6 to uh, 50 millimeters uh, roughly. And um, there is also a change unlike your adult scopes, which has got a typical um, suction port direction. There are uh, certain deviations in the suction port direction. For example, in the surgical company, Broncoflex, you have a superior suction port, whereas in the Vatan, you have a rotatable suction port. In addition to this, few uh, companies have tried to integrate advanced features like an eye scan, like in the Pentex, which have integrated into your uh, reuse of in, into your single use bronchoscope and they all few of these uh, companies are also providing a rotatable channel which becomes effective especially when you are trying to negotiate the upper lobe regions or even the apical regions so roughly if you go into the specifications of the single use bronco bronchoscope there is not much of uh, a difference amongst um, individual brands but however there are certain features like eye scan the rotatable uh, feature of the um, certain scopes and uh, even uh, the field of vision varies amongst these scopes. In addition to this, uh, now we have a lot of these single-use bronchoscopes which are also coming in the pediatric dimensions, which makes it easy, which makes it uh, quite um, easy to perform these bronchoscopes even in pediatric population. And this is another table which shows the uh, angulation measurements of a single-use bronchoscope. You can see that the uh, the angulation between the up down and the turning envelope varies between the bronchoscopes. But what is most important of this table is when you insert a forceps, what is going to be your angulation? That that makes your scope uh, uh, more um, ut more of a utility, especially when you are doing interventional procedures. So it is always good to understand what is going to be the angulation of your scope once you insert your uh, accessories like your forceps into the single-use bronchoscope. So in addition to this, uh, off late, we are also getting uh, newer scopes which are coming into the market, which has, inter which has an integrated high definition system. And uh, now if you see the ergonomics of these um, scopes, these are almost like your typical uh, uh, adult reusable scopes of good quality. Now they have got a good lever, which is uh, as sturdy as uh, your reusable scopes. And you have got a rotator at its tip, which helps in especially uh, um, helps in uh, positioning your forceps when you want to take the biopsies from the apical regions. In addition to this, it also comes with a handy um, ball collectors. Therefore, you need not require an extra accessory to collect your ball samples. So to put it in a nutshell, uh, the clinical scenarios where your single-use bronchoscope will really have an advantage is that with respect to the ease of mobility, especially when you want to do the bronchoscopy in an ICU practice, or a bronchoscopy in an emergency department or what, or an emergency bronchoscopy outside your healthcare facility, your single-use bronchoscopy becomes more uh, convenient for you to shift the scope with the monitor, unlike um, your standard scopes, which are uh, which comes with the heavy monitors and you have to move your entire cart, whereas here you can just move your uh, single-use scopes with your monitor easily to the site where you want to do the bronchoscopy. In addition to this, with, when it comes to the practicality aspects, out of us bronchoscopy, especially when you don't have a nursing staff and uh, when you don't have your bronchoscopy technician to effectively clean and give you a scope, you can straight away use your single use bronchoscope, which saves time and um, uh, human resource as well. And end of the lay, uh, day, list staff are not required to stay and clean the scopes and weekend bronchoscopy where staffs are not available to clean the scopes and bronchoscope available for airway inspection with EBUS procedures. But however, I feel like one particular area where your single-use bronchoscope can make a lot of difference with respect to the patient care is especially when we are using it for an immunocompromised patient or a post-transplant patient where it can prevent the cross-contamination of an infection and can prevent a secondary pneumonia. In addition to this, certain high-risk patients like a prion, because even if you 
sterilize or disinfectant, probably you may be at a risk of transmitting this prion disease. Uh, so with a reusable scope, so it is always advisable to use a single use bronchoscope when you are using it in a case in a patient with a diagnosis of a prion's disease. So the other applications would be in bronchoscopy training. Here also we conduct a lot of uh, bronchoscopic training and we run a fellowship program. So in such cases, uh, the single use bronchoscope really comes handy because in an untrained hand, giving a reusable bronchoscope, the cost of uh, um, correcting a damage to the scope is going to be much, much higher uh, in comparison to uh, using a single use bronchoscope. And even in your veterinary procedures, let's say for uh, training modules on uh, vet models, your single use bronchoscope has got a much significant advantage over your reusable bronchoscopes. And even in large animal and cadaveric research, your single use bronchoscope can have an important role. So I'd like, like to end my presentation uh, here. And if there are any questions, we'll take it during the time of the panel discussion. So with this, I would like to invite our uh, next speaker, um, a dear friend from US, Dr. Ashutosh. He's a consultant um, interventional pulmonologist and he doesn't require much of um, introduction. He's a renowned um, speaker and um, a researcher who is uh, uh, revered across the globe. And uh, today he will be sharing you a few of the cases uh, where he has used a single-use bronchoscope uh, in his clinical practice, and uh, we'll try to learn uh, much more from him. Over to you, Dr. Ashutosh Sachdev. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for, to the organizers, in particular, Dr. Gaur Kanti and Dr. Baba Subramanian for inviting me to share my experiences for single-use bronchoscopy in interventional pulmonary suite. I'm Ash Sachdeva, and I'm at University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. The objectives of this particular talk are twofold. One is to describe the utility of single-use bronchoscope in interventional pulmonary suite. And second is to describe how we did value creation for single-use bronchoscope given the costs, um, constraints, as well as uh, a lot of discussion on comparable quality of scopes and so on. So the idea of disposable bronchoscope is not new. It's actually 20 years old. And this particular company, which you don't hear about, uh, invented a scope with a sheath that was put over as a sleeve and tried to market an intensive care unit. We actually have the, um, not the scope, but we still have the console that was used. One of the challenges with this particular device was it was hard to steer and control the bronchoscope handle uh, and, and drive the scope in particular areas, except for uh, straightforward, just like we do a mini BL. One of the other challenges with this was uh, it got knocked down by the infection control, the infection control policies at the time. And uh, more importantly, the physician buy-in buy was not there. Uh, probably because of the image quality and uh, inferior suction quality. So as we have come along, we have focused on the desired attributes, which includes, does the scope perform as well as it should and compare with the existing high-tech technology? Does it have superior image quality? Anybody using an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy um, uh, or, or any Android device or iOS device knows that we have gone a wrong way with um, image quality with our cameras. So suddenly that has got miniaturized and cheaper. Is the scope of high quality, meaning when you hold the scope, do you feel that you are actually holding a scope or a toy? Does it fit into the ergonomics of uh, a man and a woman? Um, does it perform in terms of uh, tensile strength of the string and maneuverability? Um, and the procedure is seamlessly handle the scope just as they are handling a reusable scope. How does the scope or the tool interact with the scope? That is an important attribute for an interventional pulmonologist as we want to ensure that uh, the quality of minor changes or the, the any change or interaction is at par and if not 
better. It should be as good as what we are currently using. A big factor is the cost. So if a, a device is costly and it is to be tossed away because it's we, it's uh, disposable or single use, then a system has to be able to justify it. And I'll share some some of our experiences. And what is the overall assessment of the provider who's doing the procedure? There are a lot of scopes in the market. Um, Ambu currently has an A5 scope that has a high definition uh, digital camera, a working channel, which is more uh, caudal or uh, inferior to where the, the procedure is, is holding the scope and has a suction channel right here. Um, plus it has a rotator device. And as you look through multiple scopes, they all talk about how much bending capacity they have while the tool is in the place. There are suck, uh, uh, trap adapters that could be used and there are high definition uh, video monitors. Uh, another company, Huge Med, is marketing multiple scopes. Um, and then Viathan was recently purchased by Olympus, I believe. Um, and then we have Boston Scientific Exalt scopes. Um, I will share with you our experiences in um, how we are adapting or adopting different technologies. One of the key aspects of any scope is to understand the variety of external and internal diameter. So these scopes could be qualified as ultra slim, slim, regular, large. Um, this is just an example of what to pay attention to. Ultimately, it boils down to what is the outer diameter? What is the functionality that is desired? Are we doing a pediatric case? Are we doing a peripheral navigation case? Is there a risk for scope injury as a result of needle catheter passing across and causing a puncture? or a biopsy tool causing injury to the scope when the scope is flexed or bent in a tortuous um, airway. Where does the camera lie and where does the suction lie? For example, here there is no suction channel. Um, so this could be used for as an intubation scope where you just need visualization via endotracheal tube and some guidance and the scope has to be a little bit stiffer. And as you progress, a lot of companies are focusing on how they can get the best inner diameter for the least outer diameter. And most scopes that are classified as therapeutic scopes um, fit into somewhere between a 5.6 to 5.8 millimeter outer diameter to ranging to 6.2. And then the inner diameter is a working channel or suction channel is approximately 2.8 to 3.4 and uh, bigger is better or uh, suction is dependent on how the channel is structured and how the scope is designed. But ultimately to create the value for the patient, we need to make sure that it is impacting the patient care. If I have a patient and I just got a text as I was preparing for this uh, session about a patient who has a very large clot in the airway. So the uh, intensivist could just grab a single use scope and drive down and assess what's happening with the patient. It might take another 15, 20 minutes for the scope card to be brought in. And now with new FDA guidelines uh, and more of a recommendation rather than a mandate, uh, the scopes have to be autoclaved or sterilized, uh, not just high, in, high uh, quality disinfection. Um, the cross contamination is real, and I will share uh, some data from 2003. Um, is it accessible to uh, physicians or providers who are doing procedures? Uh, and that's something uh, that, that is related to the workflow that's established at your center. Time is a factor. When COVID hit, we actually calculated that a typical a typical time for a respiratory therapist to uh, get the scope structured, dismantled, sent to uh, central sterile processing, range somewhere between 25 to 40 minutes. Um, that is a valuable time for uh, labor force that can be cut, cut down or uh, used efficiently for better patient care and focusing on uh, implementing protocols such as 
your tidal volume strategy, making sure patients are being suctioned and so forth. And cost is very variable. Um, I will share some of our experiences uh, in a little part. This is a publication from New England Journal uh, talking about manufacturing defect in bronchoscopes. And I think what 20 years later, the way I read this publication is, well, it's a manufacturing limitation. When you have so many parts that have to be put together, there is always going to be one or the other challenge. And we have recently learned from our colleagues in gastroenterology how some of the ERCP scopes could not be cleaned properly. Um, at our center, we have, uh, you know, on the left, there is an emergency airway cart. You can see there is a monitor and a stand with a glidoscope, uh, which provides a blade that has an interior angle. And then we have flexible or single-use bronchoscopes along with um, exchange catheters ready to go with an airway bag. In our bronch suite, we have uh, another uh, single-use scope in particular because of the structure of it, the rotational component and high definition video uh, capabilities uh, that we use uh, in our procedural suite. A cost being two different types of cost. One is the cost of the scope. The other is the cost of the damage to the reusable scope. And how do you balance that out um, really depends on each individual center. This is just a snapshot of how much we paid uh, in terms of uh, scope reprocessing, scope damage uh, over one quarter. So if you're spending this much money, uh, you really need to not just look at how you're gonna prevent these damages, but also look at uh, what can you do uh, alternatively to uh, reduce this cost. So this will be very different at each individual center. And uh, I just wanna make sure people look at it uh, at their own institution carefully. So Ben said it well, uh, turnaround time, um, costly damage could be avoided, and then in mitigating the infection risk. So how do we incorporate in our interventional pulmonary suite? We do a lot of these procedures in malignant and non-malignant airway disease. Um, and I think I'll share some of the examples and um, all of you listening into this uh, webinar uh, is practicing some degree of interventional pulmonary and you could relate to where you could implement single-use bronchoscopes. So in our procedural suite, we have incorporated into diagnostic procedures, for example, lung transplant surveillance, uh, airway inspection, a therapeutic suctioning, um, where you have mucus plugs, which is truly not a diagnostic, but a combination of diagnostic and therapeutic scope. We even ventured out into peripheral navigation in difficult to bend air, airways or areas where we felt that uh, driving a P190 with a needle catheter may damage the scope. Um, uh, we are also doing a lot of robotic bronchoscopy and sometimes we need a quick uh, scope to drive and counter some of the uh, navigation challenges. We have used in balloon dilatation and stent placement in particular valve deployment in persistent airway cases. Foreign body removal uh, is an easy access in ICU where you have uh, to use a basket to extract a tooth or uh, a broken fragment or, or even a cockroach, uh, just kidding. Um, and then uh, we have incorporated heavily in our simulation learning uh, using heat and cold energy. So um, I will try to join as a panelist on the day of the webinar and I wanna point out uh, to the listeners, can you can you tell me which of the images is from a single-use bronchoscope and which of the images from a reusable bronchoscope? So I have one on the left, which there's a mucus, and then after we suction the mucus, I try to mimic uh, the same position of the scope. So it's very hard to tell. Um, I will tell you that on the right, where you see the glimpse of the endotracheal tube, that is from a reusable bronchoscope, and I chopped off the black areas, and this is from one of the reusable bronch bronchoscope. Another example, same patient, uh, you have a right upper lobe. This was an assessment for um, persistent air leak. That's the right upper lobe anterior segment, apical and posterior uh, uh, B1, B2, B3. Um, and on the right, this is same patient, 
similar image. And on the left, right here is from a single use bronchoscope. On the right, this is a reusable bronchoscope. Of course, I could have cleaned my lens a little bit with using some suction. Um, this is another patient who had um, a lot of cough and dyspnea symptoms, underwent full dose radiation therapy to the mediastinum. And you can see the pseudomembranes right in the trachea. Um, the cultures were negative. There was no viral infection. We initially thought he probably had a viral infection. And we were considering that he probably has immune checkpoint inhibitor injury. Again, you can see these pseudomembranes very clearly. These are the pictures of a reusable, uh, sorry, single use bronchoscope. This is an example of a case where we uh, uh, made an assessment of persistent air leak using balloon occlusion and methylene blue dyed saline installation in the pro space and correlated with the radiographs on where the leak might be. So I've deployed a balloon uh, measuring catheter in the right upper lobe anterior segment, and we measured the valve size to be around nine millimeter, and we were able to deploy the valve seamlessly uh, using the deployment catheter. And you can see this is a spiration valve system that is now deployed in the right upper lobe anterior segment. So typically it stands out a little bit uh, outside the ostium because the valve does settle and it uh, drives down distally by a couple of millimeters. And this is the um, shaft that we use to grab and extract the valve when it needs to be done. Methylene blue could not be seen in this particular patient, but you could uh, easily see methylene blue dyed saline uh, coming back retrograde into this. This is my colleague, Dr. Charya. He is one of our lung transplant uh, physicians and he frequently uses a, a single use bronchoscope. We can actually connect the um, monitor to our own monitor and get the image. And uh, we have no issues using fluoroscopy and seeing the scope catheters and so on. Um, this is a recent case where we had to extract uh, blood clots. There was the right mainstem BI, right row was completely filled. Here we're using a Fogarty balloon. Um, and you can see the catheter is coming at nine o'clock position rather than typical two or three o'clock position with the usable scope. Again, pay attention to where the working channel is, uh, has the output. And then you can use the rotator knob to drive the, uh, or arrange the ca um, catheter engagement with the clot or so on. Um, we were able to use a 1.7 millimeter cryo probe to extract clots. And uh, you can actually see on the right side, this is actually a bronchiectatic airway and I can see the lung tissue very clearly with the, and so the image quality is pretty high with the current generation of uh, uh, bronchoscopes. We also incorporated uh, into our pediatric practice. This is our pediatric uh, pulmonologist, Dr. Lasso. Um, we, have, we have to actually work with the pediatric team to uh, ensure that they are comfortable. Um, they are comfortable using different types of the scope. And you can easily see the scope is held in a resting position where it's, uh, the physician is at a particular location and they don't want the scope to rotate. Um, you could easily see a lot of mucus filled in this four-year-old child and a 1.2 millimeter working channel scope was used and uh, cultures were obtained. Uh, the biggest thing that we have done at our center is to incorporate it as part of our uh, continuous learning. Uh, as we all know, we don't get better just by doing procedures on the patient. We get better by uh, deliberate practice. and in the realm of competency-based medical education where your skill set is not just based on how many number of bronchoscopies you have done, but how often you have done self-reflection and made effort to practice how you're gonna modify your behavior or modify your skill set. Um, competency is merely a building block. It is not making you proficient or a master of a subject. So what I tell our trainees is when you are doing an interventional pulmonary fellowship, you are becoming a master of the trade. So you need to do deliberate practice. Now, how do they do a deliberate practice of movement beyond patient care? And I think single-use bronchoscope offers us that platform. 
Uh, we have incorporated this in monthly uh, education sessions and even weekly sessions after a uh, fellow does a procedure, I spend some time with them afterwards to just go over the uh, subtleties and uh, provide them some nuggets on how to hold a scope, what movement was missing, why there was not as good an engagement, or how do you modify your, um, how do you synchronize your movement with the patient's respiration and so on. Um, this is Dr. Holden. Um, teaching our interventional pulmonary fellow in our uh, procedural suite. We have a, a mannequin and we use low fidelity models to go over uh, not just the basics, but we also focus on advanced skills. So clearly it's easy to set up. You can do any time. Uh, there is no injury to the scope. If the scope is injured, we don't care. Um, it's a very low cost and most of the industry vendors are willing to support. Um, and more importantly, we have a very happy bronchoscopy team um, after we incorporated. So they, they are not breaking their back, running around the hospital, trying to uh, get the scope set up. Um, so I would encourage everybody to look at where you could do the value creation within your health system. And I'm happy to uh, offer my advice or help. Uh, I think Dr. Balasubramanian has my email and um, he'll be happy to share. So I want to again thank Yeshoda Hospitals and uh, Dr. Bala Subramanian and Dr. Kuruganti to uh, have invited me. So um, I will stop here and I'll join as a panelist to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashutosh, for this uh, wonderful talk and showing on how to use the single-use bronchoscope in real world um, practice. So with this, we come to the uh, third uh, uh, talk of the day. Uh, this talk is all about the future of the single-use bronchoscope uh, by Dr. Um, Wolfgang. He is from Germany and um, he has been using the single-use bronchoscope for quite some time and he has got an extensive uh, insights on how to position the uh, single-use bronchoscopy in a routine interventional pulmonology. But however, his talk would be to uh, show us what could be the future of the single-use bronchoscopy and what are the advances that we may expect in the single-use bronchoscopy in the times to come. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Wolfgang, for your talk on the single-use bronchoscopy, the future. Thank you. Yeah, hello, and uh, hello to, to India. Um, and good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Wolfgang Hohenforschmidt from Germany. I'm chief of, chief of Lung Center Lüdenscheid, a part of University of Hamburg. Um, the date, which I just named, is a little bit wrong, but you know that is uh, due to a delay, which was not my fault, right? So uh, uh, my talk is a little bit about the influence of SUFP in respiratory medicine. <clears throat> I'm interventional chief of intervention pulmonology in that lung center mentioned. Um, and I'll go ahead here. Uh, so here are my conflicts of interest. I, I, I'm not going through all of that. Where you, you may know that I'm a little bit in the area of, of coming CT and that I as well uh, uh, talk about ablation, et cetera, et cetera. Why is that jumping? I do not know. So uh, I will a little bit discuss uh, about things which will I not discuss further, like these topics. So uh, we use uh, uh, SUFBs, of course, in the area of, let's say, infection and cross-contamination problems. So like during COVID pandemic, et cetera, ICU, BMT units, uh, we, we calculated it a little bit uh, because there are there are data in Germany uh, due to the cross contamination, and you can calculate that for for Germany uh, you can save up to fifty deaths um, on ICU and these kind of units when you use SUFBs. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit uh, something like a legal thing, right? Um, uh, one thing is of course the plug and play in SUFB. Uh, uh, the capital cost, for example, uh, buying at an Olympus Tower is much uh, more expensive than buying whatever an Ambu or Vatin uh, uh, monitor, right? With all the the techniques and 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 monitor devices you need to 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 play with these kind of machines. It is very easy to handle and to transport towards the patient. We all know that. And if you go to health economics, there's a word saying microclustering analysis, which always depends a little bit on the uh, economical health system where you are in. However, there are data, uh, for example, from AMBU, 
that in the uh, US uh, environment, US uh, market, US microcostic analysis seems to deliver an economical threshold threshold below 700 scopings per year in a unit, right? So whenever you are about uh, um, that, uh, that number, then, you know, we always have to, to think of, let's say, uh, um, reusable, so normal Olympus or Pentax uh, scopes, right? There's a, a, a thing about CO2 footprints, uh, which is in Germany coming up more and more, uh, as even although we have at the moment headwinds, uh, economically uh, it plays a role in some of the hospitals because, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, um, um, how you call that? Uh, uh, if you have to decide as a patient in which hospital you would go, then uh, one factor could be CO2 footprinting. So every, everybody's going for solar, PV, et cetera. This is a problem. Well, let's say this is a factor. So all these uh, factors which uh, I here show are part of the uh, microcosting analysis. Uh, so it's highly uh, dependable. What has to be cast in regards of IP is, I mean, more or less, you could put everything through an SUFB, which you put through an RFP. But, you know, um, if you look through that list, laser is not mentioned. And uh, I can tell you that this is quite um, an issue at the moment in Germany due to the fact that, uh, for example, uh, we do not have clearance for all kinds of lasers. And for example, with Olympus happened the following, that they are not, well, we are not allowed anymore to use Thulion lasers due to four incidences uh, with these kind of lasers in Olympus scopes. Uh, so, and if you go, for example, to Ambu or Vatin and ask them, they have allowance or clearance for using these kind of uh, devices, but however, nobody has really tested it. So I would be very cautious, you know, to use it in that way, right? Um, and at the moment, I wouldn't do it. The other way around, anything else, even APC, for example, you can use quite safely uh, under uh, under Embu, for example, or with with Vatim. So there are quite some comparison between single use and reusable sc uh, scopes for interventional. And you all know these pictures of bending and debending whenever you go with a device through it. H however, you know the, the thing is a little bit. Uh, we have our own testing protocol, and that's what I want to show uh, in a few slides. Um, due to the fact that there's much more detailed discussion about what kind of scope you use because it depends a little bit on the devices which you, which you use with that kind of SUFB. For example, the, the inner sheath of a, Vatin device, of a Vatin scope is completely different to the inner sheath of an AMBU scope, for example, right? And that's why, I mean, and we all know these literatures about the degrees and deep bending, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth is something different. Uh, for example, if you use a forceps, which is uh, still have an, a, a coat, right? So like uh, Boston uh, uh, forceps in Germany have a blue coat, for example. The Olympus forceps, is, they are uncoated. They are pure metal, for example. The resistance in the working channel is completely different. That's what you have to test in reality, right? Uh, one thing, uh, as I'm a consultant of Wambo, for example, which has been already bettered, much bettered, uh, is the thing that the inner working channel has changed. The material uh, before March uh, 24 had a so-called harmonic effect. That means if you go through a scope banded several times with a forceps, for example, the inner sheath, the inner, inner channel, uh, the working channel is going to be rough more and more, right? That has completely been changed. You know? And you, you can see already uh, the, the the amelioration of working with that kind of, of armor scope that will come in a certain edition, for example. Um, it is not only scopes to intervene. Uh, we have much more endovascular steerable and uh, pre-curved guiding sheath. That is one publication about that. As I'm a cardiologist, you know, I'm using as well that uh, the Destino Twister, for example. The Destino Twister is an active sheath, right? And it has an optimized outer to inner diameter, for example. It is not cheap, right? However, it has no lens, uh, but for the periphery, we do not need lens because 
for example, me, I'm working uh, uh, very often on the cone city, and then I work in the 3D space without any visual effect at the moment, right? However, that comes from the EP sheath. And uh, here you can see, for example, the Destino Twister, how in comparison to an edge, a hundred uh, extended working channel from, from, from Super D, for example, what are the differences here? You know, you so the D bending of the Destino is much better than, for example, the of the 180 edge cap. And if you know the cost of that 180 edge cap, uh, you know, it is quite high. And the Destino is a little bit more expensive. However, that works much better. Um, Why do uh, it sorry for that. That is, that is uh, still my video there. Uh, for example, what happened still is that was, you know, an, a completely unexpected interaction between a monitor, a transport monitor, uh, the hemodynamic monitor and the SUFB monitor. You know, nothing happened, but you know, I had the, the, the AMBU uh, uh, um, uh, guy, people in the room and they, they didn't know it. So we came across during intervention, for example, that we had a breakdown of the working channels and you can, uh, you can see that here, it is a little bit trapped. The forceps was trapped by a narrowed working channel. And, and, you know, that happened sometimes in several points, you know, because look at this here, for example, you know, you see a collapse of that working channel, for example, if you, if you look, that isn't, that's a Pentax scope here, you, you will never find these things in, in let's say, the, the reusable scope. So, and that was, for example, one case where I used the, the flex needle and the flex needle got co completely trapped in the working channel of an SUFB and it was ruptured. Um, uh, so that's, so that's why I do always personal testing, you know, and, you know, I'm not, you know, that was uh, simply a session with Martin and Ambu together, and I showed different materials, which I uh, use, and then we tested it on the, on the sheet itself. What I do as well is I take the nurses because, you know, the nurses are, are using very often these kind of materials without us, you know, and they still have a feeling for that, you know, and then we look, for example, uh, for the tip to tail talk, which is very imp important um, for the peripheral navigation, right? Um, there are uh, as well, you know, uh, other literature showing, for example, uh, a little bit of that, what we already do in our labs with only five items, but we have a test protocol with over 16 items. So monitor ports, right? That is one thing, for example, for the non-rigid two-scope cryobiopsy. So we use sometimes two ambus through a rigid for cryobiopsy without ballooning, you know, where we only have one doctor, for example. Visualization, including automatic sharpening, you know, while, when reducing distance to target, that is completely different between ambu and vatium, for example. Viewing angel range, you can see the suction function, including valve functionality. Handle ergonomics, that is an aspect, for example, which could be uh, ameliorated as well uh, very individually, right? Uh, suction tube connection. For example, Vatin has a, a flexible suction tube connection that may be an advantage for some in, for some uh, settings. You know, uh, first instrument pass. Um, you know, so you you always start in the, in the beginning of the working channel and see what's happening there. The corpus shell color, as I mentioned, white shell color is uh, has some advantages to black shell color, for example. Um, corpus stiffness, so tip to tail torque, this is very important for peripheral navigation because you have to find your way to, through different branches. So whenever you rotate, you know, it, it looks like, you know, if you, it, it depends on the material, so the density of the material, but it depends as well of the outer resistance towards uh, the bronchial layer. That's what we already test. And I can tell you that AMBU is already now changing the surface. So very interesting. Bendability without instruments, you all know that. Uh, to typically test the radius without instrument, it's a difference between, let's say, radius and the bendability in total. Because, you know, whatever you have, when you have a very high bendability, but if your radius is very small, then ask yourself which instrument will pass through that, right? Um, increase of resistance, resistance towards propagation. There's one idea not only to uh, to reduce envelope surface, but as well to to build up um, uh, um, in uh, inhomogeneous uh, scope. So, for example, they have more material proximal to the handle and less material 
distal to the handle because for us it's more important the distal part so you know when you have more push that was would, would be an advantage change of geometry of a working channel that is an idea which are already uh, uh, tested by some scopes with um, um Tarumu, for example uh, and so on. So, in, and in general, of course, the relation uh, between in the inner diameter and outer diameter, right? So, and that is one thing, for example, uh, the company called Least Medical Forward, for example, that is some uh, a new new device coming from Belgium, which have a retractable lens. So, uh, they have very good um, rela uh, relations. So, for example, when we tested that new series of MB, MBA scope 5, you know, we could do much better uh, biopsies, for example, in a segment one uh, situation. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is something which you can test in real life. You know? So we have much more ideas how to ameliorate SUFB. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wolfgang, for this uh, excellent talk on the uh, future aspects of the single-use bronchoscopy. So this brings us to the end of the talks and uh, right now we'll have a, the exciting panel discussion. So we have both of our um, expert speakers, Dr. Ashtosh and Dr. Wolfgang, uh, who will be giving their inputs on uh, certain aspects of the single-use bronchoscope, which we feel of uh, relevance in the routine clinical practice. So Dr. Ashtosh, um, you have touched upon uh, on how you actually practice the single-use bronchoscopes in your day-to-day -day practice. But if I have to put it uh, to you across, like what are the specific indi indications in which you would always prefer a single-use bronchoscopy in comparison to using your reusable bronchoscopes? Do you have any particular indications where you would always resort to your single-use bronchoscopes? I wouldn't say I am rigid about uh, defining a particular indication, but there are situations where I think single-use bronchoscope is more meaningful. Um, I think our lung transplant patients where they have uh, a risk of cross-contamination, and uh, I think that's one population that is very tenuous. Um, although the risk of cross-contamination is very low, these have been reported, and um, having a patient who is uh, who is um, who has a lot of risk factors and uh, probably not going to be able to tolerate a hospital acquired infection. I think that makes sense. Um, I've also run into situations where I've taken the um, the uh, you know the working channel being on nine o'clock for one of the disposable scopes to my advantage when I'm doing a left sided procedure. We recently had a case where we were deploying an endobronchial valve and getting into the left upper uh, apical segment became a challenge despite having a full rotation on my reusable scope. And that is where it was quite meaningful. I think when I'm anticipating that there's likelihood of scope damage or there are difficult bends, it makes sense to not use the reusable scope in those situations because we are very poor in predicting when we are gonna cause a scope damage or uh, puncture to the uh, working channel. And that damage is very, very costly. Um, and I think I shared in one of my slides that yeah. just in a, a, a small quarter, the cost of our uh, scope damage repair was close to 50,000 US dollars plus. Um, I share some of my experiences from my urology colleagues. Um, if you have seen a uroscope, that is typically a smaller scope than our P190 or uh, what I call workhorse nav peripheral navigation scope. Um, and, and the urologists have to work with difficult bends when they get into, and they have to do an inferior pole lithotripsy. When we looked at the type of scope damage, which patients were getting the, or which scopes were getting the most damage, what we found was the ones where they had to actually bend completely uh, 180 degree and do a posterior uh, lithotripsy, those are the ones getting the laser damage. So I think it makes perfect sense when you talk so, talk about the mechanics and um, yes. our ability to understand and learn from what, yeah, those challenges. Cost is an issue. Um, we actually implemented uh, and very carefully, uh, strategically to uh, use the single use bronchoscope where uh, we have the ability to get reimbursed. Um, so in outpatient procedure areas that what we call um, unregulated space, 
we have the ability to get reimbursed for the disposable catheter or scope. Yeah. Um, I, I would also say that if you are training people uh, and they're going to be using heat or cold energy, that is where you may want to use reusable scopes because OV runners tend to cause more damage and injury, and uh, it gives them more freedom to actually uh, make the mistakes. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Very true. Just a little bit extension on the utility in the lung transplant patients. So uh, in the lung transplantation patients, most probably you may have to redo the bronchoscopy multiple times for removing the mucus plugs and so on. So do you use the same scope? Uh, uh, like let's say that you have used the scope once. Do you reprocess? Do you sterilize it and use the same scope for the same patient? Or is it like one time you use and you are done with the scope? So even though the company recommendations are like you use it once and that's for it, but how practical it is, because let's say that you got to use uh, a scope in like um, five, six times during the perioperative period. So is, it, is that you use a new scope every time or is it like uh, you keep one scope aside for this patient so that you sterilize it and again bring back the same scope and use it so that you cut down on the cost? Uh, is, it, is it a doable thing or uh, is it uh, applicable as well? I think the question is uh, a little bit loaded, but uh, I'll answer in two parts. One, if you have a patient who's going to get a, a bronchoscopy at the start of the procedure, uh, like they are undergoing, um, they have mucus plugging issues and they are undergoing some type of operative intervention, um, the surgery could go wrong for a couple of hours. And I think in that situation, that single use scope could be used to uh, repeatedly therapeutically aspirate and suction the airways at the end of the procedure to safely extubate the patient. Um, what we do not recommend, and that's the FDA recommendation too, and in U.S. it will be very hard to bypass that um, um, with, without getting the, the citation from infection control, uh, once a scope is used, it's a single-use scope. So let's say six hours later, the patient has a need. Um, we have to use a new, newer scope. Now, if you're anticipating that, I think the question then becomes, is it a simple procedure like therapeutic suctioning? Then we could use reusable scope and send for autoclaving and bring it back. So those are the situations where I think uh, if the cost is going to be borne by the patient, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and especially for the simple procedures. Yeah, very true. And uh, Professor Wolfgang, like, uh, uh, I know about how um, the U.S. insurance and uh, thing works, but how, how is it in Germany? Like, all the uh, single-use scopes which are being used are covered by the insurance, or is it like, because in a country like India, we have a mix of population. You have one set of population who are entirely covered by insurance, but still you have a set of population who don't have an access to the insurance care. So how do you, how does the uh, healthcare system work, um, especially in implementing single-use bronchoscopy in your clinical practice in Germany? Yeah, well, it's a very good question because, you know, uh, we are, a little, we are a, little, a little bit behind the U.S. in regards to outpatient clinic, in regards to that kind of financing uh, medical devices. So in, in Germany, just starting now the so-called hybrid DRGs. And in fact, in these hybrid DRGs, there's the plan that the bronchoscope, the scopes per use are paid. So uh, it, is, it will it will change a little bit towards like the CAFs, uh, the, the cardiologists are already doing, right? In their labs, when they do outpatient uh, clinics, uh, they get already paid uh, the exact amount of devices which they use, right? So that will change a little bit. When you talk about in-hospital use, well, there's not much to add what Ash already mentioned. For me, it's one thing uh, due to the cryobiopsy because we have a two-in-one procedure. So meaning, for example, if I do not have a second doctor for ballooning, right? I take, for example, two scopes on Vatin or Ambu and I simply cryobiopsy rupture out, take the other scope in on myself, you know, then I have uh, uh, bleeding control, et cetera, et cetera. So I use the second single use instead of a balloon, like a Boston balloon, because these kind of balloons are very expensive in Germany, right? So we can save a little bit uh, the, uh, money for the hospital and we can save the second doctor. So that is the thing with how I do it. Um, and uh, the rest 
whole uh, all that stuff about uh, cross contamination and contamination for the question if we go for auto autoclaving uh, single use we are not doing that uh, simply to the fact that this is a legal uh, aspect right uh, as far as I know uh, Ambu told us uh, that we can use these kind of scopes eight hours something like that like a shift I do not know exactly if eight or 24 hours uh, that's I mean, we do it per shift on ICU, right? So we keep them uh, beside the, the patient. So after we do it, for example, sucking up, right? We clean them normally, you know, we, you clean them, put them in that plastic sheath, right? And then keep it to the patient. But when the next uh, shift comes, we throw it away. Yeah. Okay. And uh, um, Dr. Ashosh, um, uh, so when we choose, right now we have a lot of mix of... Uh, single-use bronchoscope available in the market. So what are the parameters? Uh, I think you touched upon a little bit in your talk as well. So what are the key parameters you would, as an interventional pulmonologist, really look uh, when you really want to choose your single-use bronchoscope? Because we see most of the makers come saying that the bending action is more and everything. But when you really put an instrument into it, actually it doesn't bend to the extent what is being shown in the uh, demo. So how do you really... Uh, way a single one brand over another and what are the parameters you really look for when you want to really purchase a sort of a single use bronchoscope yeah no excellent question so we have a very robust uh, value analysis process so if a new vendor comes to us we actually have a opportunity to evaluate the product and we have to do it carefully so what you just said um when you pass an instrument and then bend the bronchoscope, it has a very different flexion property versus when you pass an instrument doing a flexion and then try to bend, um, it, it it may not be performing at the same level. Um, I think for me, the important things are optics. Um, if I'm going to do a procedure and there's some degree of blood there and it's going to mess up or um, mm. make the optics uh, a lot more difficult to understand, or I can't visualize, then that's a problem. Uh, the second thing is uh, opportunity to have different types of scopes, because as you know, with interventional pulmonary procedures, I need a, a scope that uh, I can drive to the periphery for lung nodules. I need a scope that has adequate suction despite having a sampling tool in the working channel. I need a scope that can rotate after I put a uh, sampling tool uh, to be able to get into difficult um, angles or ostiums uh, to do what I need to do. Um, so all those things are very important. Um, and we have worked with different vendors. For example, at our place in the ICU, I have two different types of products. Um, one company makes the um, direct visualizing laryngoscope that has an anterior blade. And we have scopes from that particular company as well to make it easier, especially when the patient is getting intubated and does need a bronchoscopy. And then I also have uh, my workhorse bronchoscope. The cost is pretty much uh, very similar and they are competing for a good price. I would encourage anybody to evaluate the product before you make a contract decision with a vendor and talk to your colleagues and see you know, get that information up front because you can easily anticipate these challenges uh, by knowing which all areas you're going to be using it. Yeah, that's a very valid point because many a times you just get biased just looking into the demos and you end up using it and on table you realize like some of the times the channel length is so high that your accessories don't even come out of the working channel when you really start using okay. it. So, uh, Professor Wolfgang, um, like just it's it's just because there were few um uh not case reports a uh, few case uh demos where we saw taking into the sterile nature of the single use bronchoscope few have tried extrapolating the use of these single use bronchoscope even into the plural space mm -hmm. so do you believe that um, um one yes it is doable but is it the right thing to do or do you think there are some single use thoracoscopes are also coming into the market uh, which can change the dynamics on how we actually perform a semi-rigid uh, thoracoscopy. Well, um, you know, it, it, it depends a little bit in what kind of center you're working in. I mean, if you have a thoracic surgeon, right, and uh, uh, 
Uh, in Germany, thoracic surgeons are, are very keen on, let's say, doing all kinds of intervention in the pleural space, right? So there's a little bit left for, let's say, the, the medical uh, uh, pleuroscopy or thoracoscopy. If you work in a center which has not a strong thoracic surgeon, or if you do not work in a thoracic center, right, uh, then, of course, you know, uh, you can use these single uh, scopes uh, through uh, a small cannula, and then uh, you can perform whatever, a visualization of the pleura, and the, the, uh, do a pleuroscopy and take, let's say, biopsies even on visceral or, or parietal side, right? That is, that is not the problem. However, you know, um, that may be as well, again, a legal aspect. I have not spoken uh, with our, let's say, legal department in, in, in my hospital about that. We, at the moment, do not have the need for, for that to do it because we have a, a very strong thoracic surgeon, surgeon department, right? And that's, at the moment, a big move in Germany to get thoracic surgery with pulmonology in one, in, in one department. So, for example, as I change now position to a much, much bigger hospital system, uh, it is for me uh, first week now uh, staying saying the, the the thoracic surgeons are in the internal uh, department round. You know, it's very interesting. The only surgery department always taking place in the internal department round, and uh, uh, so uh, that changes a little bit uh, the aspects. And how about uh, Dr. Ashtosh, your uh, insights on do we see a future of uh, single use semi rigid thoracoscopes or is there anything coming up uh, in near time? Like we must be the right person to know it. <laughs> so if you are thinking, I'm sure many others are thinking the same, right? So um, yeah. there is clearly uh, a value proposition for uh, semi rigid thoracoscopes. Um, there's also value proposition for rigid thoracoscopes because you can autoclave and reuse. Um, I think in a country like India, where you have yes. tuberculosis, uh, this may be a really good uh, value proposition for patients. Um, there are advantage of semi rigid, meaning uh, although we are getting smaller and smaller with the rigid scopes as well. Uh, just the trocar, maybe you save a couple of millimeters. Um, you have greater flexibility. Most uh, interventional pulmonologists are used to bronchoscopes, so they are kind of uh, in tune with using the semi-rigid scopes a little bit. Um, so I, I suspect there is going to be uh, definitely a market for that. Um, again, it depends on the pair mix, uh, how the payment structure is designed, uh, yes. who's reimbursing, and um, and patients may be asking in near future that, you know, I have a resource. I don't want, I, I would prefer to have a sterile scope, um, so forth. So, yeah. Let, let, let me add one thing. In, in Germany, it's, it's sometimes a question if, let's say, patients want to have a double loom intubation or not, because you can do, uh, let's say, uh, internal pleuroscopy. Uh, in uh, under jet ventilation without double loom intubation, that is sometimes a question. You know, then you know there may be a market as well for these kind of devices. Yeah, and Doctor Ashutosh, uh, how do you uh, really see the future of single use bronchoscope? What new advancements are we expecting? We know as of now we have got a, almost it's mimicking our routine reusable scopes with the new versions of the scopes coming with. Um, rotators and even with the dimensions as similar to that of our uh, uh, reusable scopes. So where do you really see the newer advancements is going to come in? Is there any integration of an NBA or um, do you see like how well the single use can take over the access to the peripheral pulmonary nodules? Let's say that if I want to purchase an ultra thin bronchoscope where the utility, where the chances of breakage is going to be quite high. Do we are we going to see uh, more utility of these single use bronchoscopes, especially when it comes to peripheral access, peripheral nodule access, because that is where most of our reusable scopes actually go in for a damage, especially when we make these bends or when we use the uh, cross country technique of needling and other things. So, how do you really see the future is going to be, and what new advancements you expect in it? Yeah, I I do see uh, clear cut value in both peripheral navigation diagnostics as well as therapeutics. I think when you are using heat and cold energy, not as much with cold energy, but more with laser and electrocautery, 
um, th there is a risk for scope damage. It does happen. And when you're trying to um, incorporate the biopsy tools and you have to go into upper rope takeoffs and you're trying to do a little more finesse job with um, tumor debulking, I think there is a risk for scope damage. But to your point on peripheral diagnostics, I think uh, clearly um, not everybody is going to be using robotics. Um, exactly. And that is a very uh, significant expense or capital expense for any health system. Um, 60 to 70 percent of the lung nodules can be done using a bronchoscope that is uh, reachable uh, and managed by a, a bronchoscopist, a human hand. Exactly. So um, I think that market is going to stay put for the next five to 10 years. That's where the most growth is going to happen. Um the other important aspect is how do we integrate, um, you know, cryobiopsy for the peripheral module? There is clearly uh, both road of literature coming out for safety aspect and then improvement in diagnostic yield. So combining these two things, um, I foresee that uh, there is going to be continued growth for that area. Um, I can tell you enough about the scope damages for P one ninety. I can talk. I can talk all day about it. I mean, um, the risk of having a needle puncture or having an injury from a biopsy tool, or or even somebody uh, put it in uh, on a desk and somebody came and smashed the scope. Uh, it happens. Uh, those are real challenges, and that clearly escalates the cost. Um, more importantly than the cost, I think most of the vendors or companies are looking at how best to design so we can navigate these uh, scopes um, with ease. So you don't have the translation of force proximally at the handlebar uh, is one-to-one. -one, and when you drive, it has enough rigidity to not buckle. And when you pass a tool, it still maintains the shape. So the combination of that thing probably where the holy grail is and we have the ideal scope at some point but i think there's been a lot of progress that has been made yeah and uh professor wolfgang like you were uh, in your talk you were speaking uh, something quite interesting like you adapted a technology which was used by the interventional cardiologist using a sheet uh to go to the uh, peripheral nodule and uh, take a biopsy can you just brief like how do you really do it and uh, how did yeah. you find useful, especially in peripheral nodule access? Yeah, so 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 I started that uh, already now eight years ago, and in these days uh, we didn't have the Destino Twister. Nowadays we have the Destino Twister. It's a device, a six point five F device, with an inner diameter working channel of two point four millimeter. So uh, you have a, a very small outer diameter, and uh, the good thing is it's an active sheath, right? So you can bend it. Uh, nearly 180 degrees, but it has a very good uh, tip to tail torque, right? So that's why how the intervention, interventional, uh, sorry, the electrophysiologist use it for septum puncture, right? And uh, so that these kind of instruments, they have to have, let's say a, a pretty high uh, stability, although they have not, uh, let's say too much material, right? Um, and um, we use it at the moment with a, with a wire tactic, as mentioned. So we, we put the wire, whatever, fifth, sixth segmentation. That's what we know from whatever planning. And then, you know, simple wire it down, take the wire out from there. From there on, we only go with 3D, normally with CT in my, in my place, uh, and, you know, go forward to the nodule, right? So that's how we do it. And as I mentioned uh, already, there's one uh, company coming from Belgium, Luce Medical. Uh, they have that uh, more or less the same idea. They have a, a steerable active sheath with a lens, which is retractable. So more or less what you do, you go through the vocal cords, find your whatever fifth, sixth segmentation by viewing then take off the lens. And then from there on navigate with the external navigation. And you have a, a very high, a very big working channel in regards to the outer diameter. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so I, just the one I, last, I, uh, uh, yeah, so, you wanted to ask, say something? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I do want to ask you a question. Um, if you are using single use scope in your practice, are you using high level disinfection? Um, and then if the patient has to come back to reuse or uh, just like you do for your reusable scope, are you using for another patient? I'm just curious if, 
there is a protocol that has been shown to be effective in making sure there is no cross contamination. And um, anybody done that study or? Uh, you mean to say reusing of the single use, the so called single use? Yeah. Uh, we yeah. try to avoid, uh, first of all, here, uh, uh, since cost is a binding factor, uh, we still, as you rightly said, we also try the use of uh, single use to a very narrow subsegment of population. Now, like we, as you said, our unit also has got a lot of these transplants, so we try to figure uh, figure and use it exclusively for them. Sometimes uh, uh, when we find that the patient is a totally an immunocompromised patient in an ICU where I don't want any sort of a uh, contaminant from my scope, then I use a single-use bronchoscope. And as you said, uh, since we also run a fellowship program and we wanted to train a lot of um, fellows, uh, in those instances, we use single-use scopes. So when it comes to the fellowship program, yes, uh, sometimes since we do it on a lot of these mannequins uh, and other things, so we reuse it. So there is no problem with the uh, guideline recommendation. So when it comes to the uh, mm -hmm. transplant patients and the immunocompromised patient, um, uh, uh, luckily, we uh, we never had an instance of um, reusing it multiple times, um, uh, except for one or two patients where we had to reuse it. So in that case, we tried to stick on to it um, uh, till the guideline recommendation. But after that, we let's say that it, it crosses beyond, um, then we just shift to our reusable scopes. So even here, the experience with the single-use bronchoscope um, is uh, uh, limited as of now. That's why like, I thought this webmate would, will actually throw light on how you need to triage your resources of a single-use bronchoscope. But I, in India, I find it it will have a lot of uh, practical implications uh, with the upcoming lot of new transplant programs and uh, more uh, IP colleagues, I, more interest in IP amongst the younger fellows, maybe in the training and in the handling of the instruments by the IPs, I feel the single-use bronchoscope will have a much wider utility in India. Maybe the routine use of single-use bronchoscopy uh, for patients undergoing a diagnostic procedure, I think it, it takes a little more time until and unless the insurance gives a broader coverage for the use of these uh, scopes. Yeah, one area that I really felt it was a blessing with the single-use was um, the training of the fellows. I mean, yeah. I'm talking about row fidelity simulation. I could take a scope, reuse it for exactly. uh, every week and uh, show them different techniques and have them practice on a mannequin versus uh, trying to get a scope and then sending it back for uh, autoclaving yeah. or high. Yeah. 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 So even all Thank our uh, cryo and everything uh, on the animal model these days are re are entirely single use. Uh, single use. Uh, the, in such cases, we may end up reusing it because it's only on the... Yeah. Uh, cadaveric model or in the mannequin. So it's no more a single use. Uh, so just one last question uh, uh, to you, Dr. Ashutosh, before we call it for the day. So what is your uh, take on, uh, because this is some interesting area which I really found where single use can be of uh, more uh, importance in pediatric bronchoscopes, because uh, uh, many a times uh, either the pediatric colleagues don't have an access because purchasing a bronchoscope and keeping it uh, for an emergency pediatric intubation or a pediatric ICU is uh, uh, really not cost uh, effective model. So yes. here we found out that uh, just getting a pediatric single use bronchoscope and using it um, as and when required actually translated into a much better uh, cost effective model. So how does it work in US? Does your pediatric colleagues, especially with the upcoming of pediatric pulmonary, pulmonary programs, would it make sense that a single use with the pediatric uh, uh, dimensions would really change the scenario in the pediatric interventional pulmonology? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in my talk, I uh, touched upon how we have incorporated uh, the single use in our pediatric practice. We were a little bit skeptical, so were my colleagues in pediatric family. Uh, despite having a very vast inventory of bronchoscopes at our center, we are, you know, 13 hospital health system, and we are the flagship place. Um, when we introduce single use, our colleagues have um, uh, had a favorable response so far. We have done less number of cases, but clearly, let's say you're doing 50 pediatric bronchoscopies a year or 100 a year. It is not cost effective to have, um, in my my world, $200,000 worth equipment, including the cart and so on. 
plus um, being able to mobilize resources to bedside where most of the foreign body aspiration are or blood clot uh, extractions are uh, versus outpatient bronchoscopies that are very few in, in, in general. Like, you know, you have uh, patients with chronic reflux or asthma that is uh, uncontrolled and you're looking for reflux and um, combined esophageal as well as bronchoscopy procedures. Um, in general, the ILD uh, in, instance is very low in pediatrics. So uh, most of these happen to end up being um, inpatient procedures. Um, so I think clearly there's uh, value to uh, the single-use bronchoscope there. Now, if you have a separate department, and most places do, they don't have an integrated department of interventional pulmonary, uh, there is some space separation and uh, I think the physicians in the pulmonary, pediatric pulmonary side are much more comfortable uh, having access to a scope that can they can use at nighttime or uh, odd hours and, and you don't need an entire team to set it up. Yeah, very true. And uh, one final word from Professor Wolfgang, like, like uh, if at all you want to say the younger colleagues about uh, the single-use bronchoscope, what would you really want to say to them? Like one final word before we... Uh, close for the day. So, yeah, I think what you is know, it? yeah, I, I think uh, they still have a way to go. Uh, they can optimize uh, some details on mechanics, as I mentioned. They are now working, for example, on the surface. Um, there's an idea of um, um, you know d different materials, for example. So I think we will see um, in whatever two years, three years. More scopes, more specialized scopes, especially for, for the periphery, I would say in the Western world, or what Ash already mentioned, uh, there's nothing to add on uh, in these special units or in ped pediatrics. Uh, so I think you know they still have uh, some room to ameliorate, to, 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 to be better yeah. on the mechanics. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ashtosh and Professor Wolfgang. It was uh, uh, Pleasure having both of you here and sharing your insights on uh, single-use bronchoscope. Hope the audience had a good time uh, getting your valuable inputs uh, and maybe we connect soon, maybe with more advancements in the field of single-use bronchoscope and interventional pulmonary. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thanks for the no, Thank you for the opportunity and uh, say hello to Pavan and thank you so much for putting the effort. So.